in the struggle for human dignity and human rights. I make that point because I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm very sensitive to it, and I think it's important. I'd like to start the discussion here on the question of bias just with a few minutes to, to sort of give a historical perspective, because I truly believe that unless we do that, uh, I, I think we start off the discourse with uh, uh, incomplete foundation. And what is, what is the root cause of bias? You know, it's, uh, uh, there are primary issues, as you know, when you take your exams, and there are secondary issues in a legal problem. And I believe that the primary cause of uh, bigotry against Afro-Americans and, and Latinos and gays and lesbians is a class question. I mean, if you study the history of, of oppression against Afro-American people, uh, there was developed a legal, a moral rationale for having a slave society. I mean, the white ministers had to get up in front of the flock, and how would they justify oppressing an entire uh, uh, nation, if you please, continent of people. And they developed the distorted concept that even God uh, willed uh, that white people should dominate black people. Because how could you justify a slave system? You had to do it that way. And then when we got rid of slavery, the, uh, how do you justify uh, the class oppression uh, of people and... and uh, 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 how do you not use Afro-American people uh, working at lower wages uh, to keep the wages of white workers down? And if you read, you might want to do that uh, uh, to get a real uh, trade union uh, understanding of what America is really all about and what the law is all about. Because when I went to law school, I thought I would go to law, uh, college and uh, into law school and be able to fight for poor people. Boy, was I disabused of that quickly. As you know, 90% of what you learn deals with property, and, and you are inculcated with the sanctity of property, that nobody can touch it, and there are certain rules that you have to follow, uh, uh, which are diametrically opposed to the whole concept of trade unionism. So if you want a nice history uh, of what really happened in America with trade unions, and really what was at the root cause and the bottom of the laws of trusts and monopolies and property and all of that. Read a little book called uh, Labor's Untold Story. And, and that, I think, will give you a, a very good uh, uh, background, it seems to me. But in it, you will see that there was a struggle within the trade union movement when it was beginning in America to how do we treat our black brothers and sisters? Do we let them into the trade unions? Uh, do we not let them into the trade unions? And we know this is the way the advocates of, of embracing uh, the black uh, workers uh, was, listen, the bosses are using them to break our strikes. They're using them to depress our wages. And this was a real situation uh, in America for many, many years, and it goes on today. So I believe that the whole question of bias has that class basis that we really need uh, to understand. Uh, there is a class analysis in everything. Drugs? How come the white community never gave a tinker's damn about drugs when it was in the Afro-American communities and the Latino? But when it came into Oz, boy, now we're starting a war uh, on the drug trade. Um, uh, Dick Gregory used to tell a joke. He used to say, I don't know, uh, following this theme, he said, uh, the government was able... Uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover was able to destroy the Communist Party uh, very quickly, uh, but uh, uh, they can't do anything with the drug trade. He said, I can take you to Harlem and show you any 10-year-old kid that could point out all the drug pushes and, and nothing ever happens uh, uh, to them. So I'm suggesting that the whole question of bias has had against Afro-Americans and Latinos and women has had an institutional class basis from the beginning. And when you have that, that that hangover comes up and it carries over and it's sort of like an anchor preventing those of us who want to go forward and we have to recognize it. We have to recognize where it's coming from uh, and then I think we're a better able to uh, uh, examine it. So on the question of the bill that we have passed in Albany, I had, I had moved, uh, I'm sorry, I had introduced 
a similar bill a number of years ago, more years than I like to remember, uh, that would have had those basic provisions which would take a crime otherwise committed uh, and give it a stiffer penalty if it was bias related and we were targeting at that time the Ku Klux Klan, uh, the Nazi parties and desecrations of uh, uh, places of, uh, uh, of worship and I got opposition from the ACLU and that raised for the first time in my mind I mean, I thought I was on the side of God. How, how could you be wrong when you're opposing uh, the Nazis and, and the Ku Klux Klan? And uh, I was a little embarrassed that I hadn't seen it, uh, but they raised the constitutional question. They raised the constitutional question. How do you uh, punish people for their beliefs? I mean, if I beat up on you uh, because you're, uh, you happen to be a white uh, person with nice blonde hair and... and uh, and I, for some reason, hate you, or if I go to that uh, black uh, sister over there and, and I'm, a, uh, I'm a racist, I don't like her, but why should I get a stiffer penalty? That's my opinion. You can't deny me my opinion to hate. That's what America is all about, the opinion to be able to uh, express my opinion and feel what I want to feel, whether you like it or not. And that was a very serious question that I had to... Uh, I had to uh, uh, struggle with and uh, and I fell down on the side that society has the right to do that uh, another book uh, oh god I forgot the name of it maybe it'll come to me it's a book about the whole question of freedom of speech in America and it starts out with the arrest and indictment of a group of anarchists right here in uh, in New York City who were opposing uh, the second, the First World War, uh, and were opposing uh, the fact that President Wilson had sent an army uh, to the Soviet Union to overthrow their revolution and restore uh, the Tsar. And they were, and there was the sedition laws on the books, which said that if you opposed uh, the war or the conscription by word or deed, uh, that you would go away for ten years. And these people were Jewish. Uh, anarchists from the Soviet Union uh, and they were indicted and uh, convicted and the appeal went to uh, Justice Holmes and he articulated his clear and present danger uh, uh, concept uh, that when there is a clear and present danger to the government's existence that the government has the right to take away the right of speech and uh, and I said, my God, is this the guy that they told us was a great civil libertarian? This sounds very, very different than that uh, for me. Vanishing Fates, I think the name of the book was. Excellent book for a young lawyer. You should read those, that book. Uh, uh, however, uh, Holmes was uh, uh, befriended by some other legal scholars who began to question his clear and present danger concept and that concept began to get refined and refined and in a sense what it did was it got transposed uh, to a uh, to a uh, concept that would protect speech uh, unfortunately for those people they went to jail uh, agreed to be deported and after I think two or three years in jail they got deported uh, but uh, their lives were disrupted because of that Hysteria. So what I'm raising is I'm raising the question of hysteria being one of the greatest dangers to a democratic society. Hysteria was what took the Japanese Americans and took their property and put them in concentration camps. Hysteria during the days of McCarthy was what destroyed the lives of thousands of people and sent people to jail only because what they believed, uh, happened to believe in, which was very unpopular at the time. So when we deal with the question of bias, this is an issue that I, I as a lawyer and a legislator, uh, had to think of very clearly. Uh, and, and, and I came down uh, with this, uh, this approach, and that is society does not have the right to prevent anyone from thinking what they want or articulating uh, what they want, as long as what they're saying 
is not part of a conspiracy to do damage to someone else, and I would define conspiracy very strictly, because you can use conspiracy to put Grandma Moses in jail, if you like. Uh, so I would define that very carefully. And uh, uh, there would have to be uh, a very strict definition of conspiracy, which would then result in damage to somebody else. Because suppose I don't happen to like uh, someone and, and I don't burn their house down, but I get that person fired and destroy them financially. Uh, that to me is something society has to say, not here. We will not allow that and to fashion an appropriate punishment. So we are not, in my mind, saying, well, if I come to you and I beat you up in a fight in a bar because you like Elvis, Elvis Presley and I don't, uh, and there was no bias involved, uh, whether or not you like Elvis Presley could be a question of bias, but that's something else. Uh, well, that's a fight, and, uh, and now we're saying, well, if that's a, a D felony or an E felony, uh, and now we're going to say if you call me a dirty name or something and there is some bias, it's a biased crime, we're going to punish you further. I don't see that as an extra punishment. I see it as using the basic crime, the element, the acts and the injury as a criteria, criteria for the injury and then the punishment can fit the crime. So on that basis, I said to my friends at the ACLU, I'm sorry, but on this one, uh, we have to part company. And, and then the bill began to develop further and further. The Black and Puerto Rican Caucus, uh, which is a, a group of obviously black and, and Hispanic legislators, uh, uh, took that bill, Roger Green um, in the assembly and David Patterson uh, in the Senate and developed that bill over the years and that's the bill that we have. Now, I would like to uh, get off the legalistic approach, um, uh, if I can, uh, to give you um, sort of a, a little bit of a, a presentation of what happened in Bensonhurst when Yusuf Hawkins was killed. Uh, because I think that what happened in Bensonhurst can very well, very well be the model the model of what those of us who are appalled by the increasing racism, which also you will find, by the way, that as a society uh, that has classes, when things begin to get bad, when unemployment begins to increase and dislocations take place, that bigotry increases. It is a part of social economic dislocation, and I think history will prove me right. And if you look around, you begin to see it. England at one time, there was no really very little uh, uh, expressions of racism. Uh, but as unemployment began, uh, people of color uh, began to uh, find themselves uh, becoming victimized by racist attacks uh, by white people. Uh, when I worked as a longshoreman, uh, I can tell you that the Afro-American longshoremen uh, were considered enemies of uh, the Italian longshoremen. You know why? Because we were afraid they were going to take our jobs. And to his credit, Tony Anastasia, who was called Tough Tony, and the way they treat Italian, if I'm wandering, forgive me, I want to get it all out, <laughs> uh, uh, discrimination against Italians uh, uh, exists. If some people don't, don't think it exists, please let me abuse, disabuse you of that. Uh, but Tony was considered Tough Tony, the labor boss, you know, connotations that that has tough Italian underworld that kind of that whole kind of uh, of a presentation when um, an economic development program was begun in Brooklyn and all uh, new piers were being built and that was in the 50s he ordered that not a pier should open that would not have Afro-American longshore people uh, working there in not great numbers, but significantly different than, I mean, when you go from zero, you know, to a number, that's a significant change. So where you had five white gangs working on a pier of 20 men, the gang was made up of 20 men, that was the unit, uh, he ordered that at least one uh, Afro-American gang had to be there. 
uh, and, and other positions uh, Afro-Americans had uh, to have jobs. And that, I want to tell you, uh, uh, was a tough, courageous decision. Because how do you tell a longshoreman, we used to work day by day. You never knew how much you would bring home that week. Uh, how do you tell a white longshoreman who's had it great all these years, he or she, there were no she's then, he would have to step aside uh, for an Afro-American. But he did that. Uh, but as far as discrimination is concerned, I mean, I can tell you when I was going to Brooklyn Law School, working as a longshoreman, hurt myself and, and, and really couldn't do heavy work anymore, uh, a friend of mine worked for Allstate Insurance. And I went to law school from 62 to 67. So it wasn't, you know, back then. Uh, I applied for a job as a claims examiner at Allstate, and I must have interviewed extremely well. I took a test, and, and, and they told me I, I was great, and they were going to hire me, and then all of a sudden there was no more job. And a friend of mine, a friend who alerted me to this position, said, Frank, they're afraid you're connected to the underworld. So I went back to work in pain, and that's how I finished law school. So that exists today. It existed, it exists in the tragedy of the murder of Yusuf Hawkins in Bensonhurst. Now I think we have to be clear. Attacks against black people, Afro-American people, are not just bias related. They have to be viewed, in my judgment, as a lynching because the history of Afro-American people in America is a history of lynchings. And I learned that from my friend Al Van, who's a member of the assembly from Bed-Stuy. And I learned it in this way. After the, the killing of Yusuf Hawkins, forgive me if I'm jumping around, but I want to make this point in this way. Uh, I organized a meeting of Afro-Americans led by David Dinkins, Charlie Rangel, Hazel Dukes, uh, Father Lucas, uh, Jim Bell, and I can't think of who else, uh, that came to Bensonhurst and we met in the church, St. Dominic's Church, and we met the Italian-American community to discuss what was going on and try to bring some calm uh, uh, to the situation. And I said, we need to have reconciliation. And Al said, Frank, before we can have reconciliation, we need to have understanding. He said, you can't tell me that the killing of Yusuf Hawkins was a murder. It was a lynching. And then it struck me. If you read the history of Afro-Americans in our nation, it is a history of lynchings. There was a book written a long, long time ago. The name of it was We Charge Genocide. And documented in that book were the Afro-American people that were being killed, lynched, had been lynched historically ever since Reconstruction, and it wasn't right after Reconstruction. We're talking the 30s and the 40s. So that when an Afro-American is killed, you can't look at it as a killing. It's got to be looked at in a historical per, uh, perspective if we are going to understand what it means to Afro-American people. And we have to understand what it means. Now, I made that point to the people in Bensonhurst, and first they were appalled. But the killing of Yusuf Hawkins was a, a special event. A few years before that, four or five years before that, a fellow by the name of Willie Turks was working in the Transit Authority car barn on Avenue X and McDonald Avenue, which is near Coney Island. And it was break time, and he went to a deli to buy some bagels for himself and his brothers and sisters, and he never got back. He was beaten to death by a gang of Italian youth. That's Willie Turks. The community reacted when the Afro-American community marched in protest in a sense of what do they want from us? We didn't do it. Why are they, are they coming here looking for trouble? We're going to give them trouble if they want trouble. And we were able, in a very primitive way, to calm the community, and the march came, and that was the end of it.
this time there was that talk but there was other talk qualitatively different qualitatively different this time there was real pain there was identification the mothers were saying my god what was that mother be going through that could have happened to my son and there was that sense of moral outrage in the community alongside of that was again a feeling of being dumped on and people need to understand this because we Italian Americans we are dumped on and if you're an Italian American and you haven't gone to the Anglo-Saxon world and you still live in Bensonhurst or you haven't forgotten because I was on a talk show with one who I think she forgot what it was to be an Italian American in an Italian American community that insidious oppression discrimination that we face any TV program you watch who are we with the buffoons or with the killers or with the thieves I loved the movie Moonstruck but I didn't like it you know why I didn't like it it painted us as nice people not too bright but nice people we sing we have nice food we drink wine we love the opera but that's all we are that's the insidious kind of oppression that we feel so Italian Americans we feel that we are dumped upon we feel that we are still not first-class citizens like everybody else and you can hear it my friend Dante Nacarado who's a, a a young man who came from Italy is here a number of years he was telling me not too long ago when he used to go to Brooklyn College the harassment that he was subjected to so in order to understand the, the reaction of the community when the march came they felt well why are you beating up on us we didn't kill him and they reacted as if they were being invaded incorrectly now I'm not condoning but most of the people that reacted reacted in a quiet way maybe they were upset maybe they were angry but they were quiet those of you who saw TV saw a problem that we have we are losing a substantial proportion of our young people to drugs and crime and social disorientation anti-social behavior I just came from criminal court this morning with a woman whose son was almost beaten to death by a gang of white youth from Bensonhurst 14 and 15 and 13 year olds tried to beat her son to death we have a very serious problem in our community we have gangs who are driven by this macho image of John Gotti and the others and who are not doing well in school and maybe whose parents are both going to work thank God for that Reagan revolution that made everybody rich if you believe that I'll t tell you something else but we have all these problems and our kids are really victims of that these are the kids that held up the watermelon that used the, the vile words that day so to the world it appeared that it was all Bensonhurst is Bensonhurst free of racism absolutely not I'm not going to stand here and tell you that they are but I'm telling you that in my judgment Bensonhurst is no more and no less racist than any other neighborhood maybe it's more open maybe it's more open I mean when the Attorney General uh, reveals that some of the prestigious Wall Street firms are telling the employment agencies we don't want blacks and Hispanics is that racism damn well it is damn well it is while they're keeping blacks and Hispanics out of their Wall Street firms they're hiring uh, Afro-Americans or Hispanics to take care of their kids that they've always done and that's how they show how liberal they are but when it comes down to the real evil of racism which is denying somebody the right to work they're right up there they're right up there so what I'm saying is that Bensonhurst seems to me needs to be analyzed you look you find that we have a dropout rate of 30 percent 
You find that crime, violent crime, has increased in Bensonhurst 30%, and the police forces have dropped 20%. You find that our subway systems are one of the worst in the city. And the list goes on and on. So what I'm saying is that unless we begin to identify the root causes of these conflicts and begin to deal with them, we're never, never, never going to solve this problem. And for those who think that it's too ingrained, let me just tell you, I was at, let me share this with you. I forget it was the second or third uh, uh, march that was coming. And I want to tell you, I never saw so many police in all my life. And uh, we had been out the night before, walking the streets, talking to young people, uh, urging them to remain calm. The people have a right to march, and we should not interfere with that right. And what was interesting is the first day of the parade of the protest march, there was a young fellow who, they call him the Hulk, so he wears a, some kind of a bandana, and he's got a mustache, and he's pretty well built, so he fancies himself the Hulk. And he was the one chasing the parade uh, with an American flag. So I spotted him, and I went straight for him the night before. And I said, look, you got to do me a favor, you know, and you can't do this tomorrow. You, you, you can protest, but be calm and, and respect the people and so forth and so on. And he said to me, Frank, I don't hate black people. He said, I was in Vietnam. I dragged my black buddy out of the jungle when he got killed. I'm angry that they're coming here in our neighborhood. So I said, look, I'm not going to go through it. We discussed it with him, and he said, okay, I promise. He said, I'm not putting up my flag. I said, no, no, no problem. But, you know, just be cool. He said, okay. The next day, we were at the point where the parade would start, and we had been all night out, not all night, we had been out for about 10, 11 o'clock at night, talking, speaking with people, and uh, what's funny is I used to say to them, look, I'm giving you a field command. I'm making you one of my lieutenants now. Your job is to keep everything calm tomorrow. So what was funny is the next day, I'm jumping ahead again, forgive me. Uh, I was going through and I saw this group of young people and I said, okay, fellas, we're going to be calm, right? So one of them says, Frank, I'm one of your lieutenants. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So we did a pretty good job there. But going back, when the parade was about to begin, the march, two people, two young men came who were pretty looking for trouble. They were looking for trouble. And I'm not going to discuss how, it's really irrelevant, but we got into a discussion of what really was happening. And you know something? Like that, and these two guys were leaders, like that, they said, okay, there's no more trouble today. And in fact, one fellow put up a sign, uh, which was Bensonhurst, it's our neighborhood, but then there was something else that wasn't nice. And they all shouted him down, take that sign down. So all the signs, the racist signs came down. And the protest march came and went, and not an incident took place. Now that told me, because as I was walking through, I could sense that people were ready for a change. The meeting we had in the, in the basement of St. Dominic's Church is going to be followed up with another meeting. I've met with Mayor Dinkins and articulated to him the need to begin to have contacts. I was at a meeting of the Federation of Italian American Organizations, and they organized an exchange in Reverend Daughtry. Oh, Reverend Daughtry was at that meeting I talked about. Reverend Daughtry, a great, great activist. Uh, a clergy person. There was an exchange, and Italian Americans went to Reverend Daughtry's church, and this woman came back, and it was it was it was emotional for me, uh, as an Italian who's been around all these years and lived with this problem. Uh, this young woman got up and said, "You know, we went there. They're nice people. They treated us so nice." And we invited them to come to our church. And then I knew that we could deal with it. Then I knew. So Dinkins is, is committed uh, to put together some structure to deal with this question. Uh, we're working together with uh, Roger Green, Assemblyman Green, 
and the Martin Luther King Commission for the peaceful resolution of, of conflicts, nonviolence, and we have a pilot program that we're putting into place with Chancellor Fernandez, where we're going to have a program of three schools in Bed-Stuy and three schools in Bensonhurst to begin to teach people how to resolve their problems in a nonviolent way. Because we have a serious problem in our society. And when I say to Roger Green, we got problems with violence in Bensonhurst, he says, Frank, come to Bed-Stuy. So I guess what I'm saying is that I think bias has to be treated in two ways. One, it cannot be tolerated by society, and society has a right, has a right to outlaw violence, racial violence, bias against uh, the human rights of people and ascribe to it a more stringent penalty. But society also has to begin to recognize that we need to build bridges. And I'll end on this because uh, uh, too many times when the tough decisions have to be made, for instance, we're having a discussion in Albany now do we build more prisons? And you must be aware of it that the public doesn't want to build prisons. They just want to kill everybody and, and have a permanent solution. If the words sound familiar, I'd even feel that way. A permanent solution to crime. Kill them. Uh, we're discussing stopping building more prisons. That's not a politically popular thing to do. And when it comes to bias and taking the difficult positions, I just leave you with the words of uh, Martin Luther King, uh, who said that uh, uh, he's not concerned with the utterances of the racists. What he's concerned about is the silence of the good people. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you like to take this question? If there's questions, sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me first take, let me take the first point you made. As a legislator, you have to make some decisions, and, and I alluded to it before. When you have a movement to, to get a bill enacted, and that movement is vibrant, and it's alive, and it's moving, and there's a countervailing force that says no, you have to make a very honest decision to avoid being a political opportunist. But you have to say, if I give in to the opposition to get a bill, if we say, OK, we will take out the piece that deals with uh, uh, violence uh, based upon sexual orientation, and look at all the other people it's going to help, you have to say to yourself, well, does that diffuse the movement that we have the generation, the, the, the power uh, to get this bill enacted, and do we end up with a watered-down version, and as a result, 